issues around the world. And we looked at an example in Rwanda where they sort of failed, and an example where they succeeded. Um, can't remember. Had you left us before that point, Harry? Um, I was there. I did the good and the bad example, but yeah. I left before Syria. Left before Syria. Yeah. Oh, we got that far. Did, did you? Did I? Were you here when we looked at the um, the International Criminal Court? I don't think you were up to that point. Let, let's see, anyway. Yeah. So, um, we got through all this stuff about torture, North Korea. We did the eight stages of genocide. Um, so we got up to here. So. I think maybe you were here for the UN, you were for Rwanda. Yeah. Yeah. And then this bit. Yeah. I was and then that as well. we drilled down into this, and I think this is where where um, we're here for this. Maybe this. I think yeah. this is where after you left. Yeah, I've not yeah. done this. Yet. Okay, so let's go back to that. Let's go back to this picture. Okay, so we looked at. Um, do you remember what what point was I trying to make about this? So we got these two case studies. Um, and then I was trying to contrast that with Syria. What, what lesson was I trying to? I was just telling you about things that happened in ninety four and nineteen ninety one. If we're thinking about Syria, what was the point of me doing that? I don't know if I was here for the Syria bit. I don't do that bottom bit. Uh, yeah, well, and uh, but what's happening in Syria? Before we come to to sort of the explanation of it, what's happening in Syria right now? Sort of a dictatorship? Uh, yeah, there's a massive civil war, isn't there? So, and, and oh, do you know if we're, are we involved at all? British, the, is Britain involved or has been involved recently, very recently? Um, isn't the Prime Minister like, join America in airstrikes? Yes, there? yeah, and why, what were those airstrikes a response to? Um, apparently, having them having chemical weapons that they used, yeah. So, if we're thinking about the fact that we have recently bombed um, Syrian forces in uh, manufacturing uh, in this area, how how would how would these two case studies link in with that? I was trying to make the argument almost for getting involved at this point. What what happens if the UN doesn't get involved or the international community? Uh, then the issue just gets worse and nothing's really done about it. And what can happen if the international issues, if the international community gets involved? It can sort of bring the issue to a close and stop it from getting any worse. Right, yeah. So the point I was trying to make is that here we have an example of the UN not getting involved and it led to terrible consequences. Here we have an example of the UN getting involved, the international community getting involved, NATO as well, um, and it being less bad than it could have been. So the argument that I'll be making is that this is this is how you know we should be getting involved in Syria because the lessons of history shows us that if we don't, things get worse. Now, when we come to look at in future lessons about specific conflicts, we're going to look at the opposite, opposite side. You know, maybe why we shouldn't be getting involved because some people would argue that the whole legacy of Syria is to do with us getting involved in that part of the world. But we'll come to that in future. So, um, we, we looked at the Rwanda a little bit, um, we looked at Yugoslavia, but what I want to drill down into this a little bit more, so looking at human rights abuses and things that went wrong, um, is two particular, I mean there were many, many terrible things happened, but two particular things that happened which were particularly bad um, incidents that happened, and then what happened to the people who organised this, the, the leaders of these countries that were involved. So, um, we've got Yugoslavia here. Uh, can you tell? Do you remember? Can you tell me a little bit about what actually happened with this conflict and why it was so terrible? Um, I think it was something to do with Serbia. Yeah. And they sort of invaded somewhere else. Back yeah, Bosnia and Her well, the and Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And they tried to take. You can see the pink. The pink colour is sort of Serbian people. Um, they tried to take the land and, and kill kill everyone who wasn't Serb, basically, ethnically cleanse it, in that horrible phrase that they use, um, and take that. And the international, and the international community stopped it, but um, 
not before many hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Um, okay, so war crimes during the Yugoslavian civil war and international justice. So that that this is within the the um, Yugoslavian thing, but um, I want us to drill down into this a little bit more because I want us to look at how. I mean, the similar thing, when we come to look at Syria, the similar things that have happened in Syria, you know, terrible atrocities, but these people were brought to, to justice. Um, and, and what we want to think about is could the same thing happen to Assad? You know, he's the dictator of Syria uh, and the people, the, the generals that have carried out his wishes. Um, should we be pushing to, you know, send troops in or get them or put them on trial? Um, Okay, so war crimes during the Yugoslavia Civil War and international justice. I mean, there were sadly countless thousands, but two incidents in particular stand out. Um, have we got that title? Yeah. You might want to draw a little diagram like that because it does feed in. I mean, there's a lot of notes on some of them, but what I would say, I'll highlight certain bits and also think about, think about paraphrasing things, think about summarising. And this is obviously will be on Moodle for you to go back and look through at your own leisure. Um, so, uh, one, one of the such issues was the siege of Sarajevo from 92 to 96. I'll come back to some images here. Um, let, let's, let's have a, just, just let me back up a second actually. Just let me back up to this. So, um, Sarajevo is there. And Srebrenica is sort of in this area as well. And what you've got is you've got this area that's surrounded by the Serbs, Serbian forces, um, but it's still meant to be part of Bosnia. So they were trying to they were trying to take the city. The Serbs were trying to take the city over. Okay, so um, Serbian forces surrounded the Bosnian territory of Sarajevo. They held it under siege for nearly four years, which is actually one of the longest sieges. Um, it's even longer than the siege of Stalingrad in World War Two, if you're into a bit of history. Now, one of the long, I think it might be the longest siege that has ever took place. And what the, as we'll see when we zoom in on some of these pictures, um, the Serb army was using snipers and mortars. You know what mortar is? It's kind of when you two in, <coughs> fires off um, a, a bomb, basically that explodes and kills loads of people. Um, so over those years, you know, 5,000 civilians were killed um, by snipers. But what, I mean, the international community was on this and was, you know, wringing its hands about it, what shall we do? But um, in 94, what happened was the Serbs, they actually shelled a marketplace, um, killed 68 people, which, you know, that, that was seen as the last straw and people really got angry about it. Uh, the UN Secretary General requested NATO bomb Serb forces. Do we remember what NATO is? Uh, the sort of international, sort of the take right, bits of the army from the member countries and yeah. sort of put them together. Yeah. And sort of send them into countries where there's issues. Well, the, that has become the case, but do you remember what, what was NATO originally founded for? The Cold War. The Cold War, which was against who? Um, Russia. Or yeah, Russia. Um, and what, what, um, what was it actually meant? When would it have come to life, so to speak? What was the mission of NATO? I mean, it was meant to defend against Russia, but what, what's the principle which underlies NATO? Why do all these countries chip in? Um. It's a bit like the Three Musketeers. Yeah. So if they get attacked, then they all sort of protect each other. Yeah. So and it's meant it was set up to fight against the Russians. So a controversial point here is, why was NATO then that was founded to defend against a, a war with Russia, is getting involved with these kind of things? You know, some people would say, well, just, you know, the Western countries they spend all this money on armaments, so they just want an excuse to use it. And some people go as far as saying, well, it was being used to you know intimidate the Russians. I mean, back in the situation with Russia in '91 was a lot different just come out of communist dictatorship. Boris Yeltsin, erratic guy, crazy guy really, I should have spent a little bit more talking about him. He, he was really, he was the president of Russia, but he obviously had a drinking problem, because there's lots of videos, I wonder whether I can get him on there, of him drunk doing crazy stuff. Um, 
but he, he was more friendly to the West anyway, and he was a bit of a believer in democracy. That sounds strange when we've got Putin these days, but um, old Boris, yeah, Boris Yeltsin. Um, anyway, Russia was on board with this one. You know, the Security Council was on board. There wasn't as much pushback. Yeah, there were tensions because Russia would, you know, usually seen itself as friendly towards the communist bloc, but not in this not in this case because. Class. Yugoslavia had always been it was a communist country but it was independent from the Soviet Union, it wasn't part of the Soviet Union so there wasn't that there wasn't that closeness or that feeling of ownership that Russia had over Yugoslavia um, it's like a different model uh, NATO, Operation Deliberate Force attacks the Serb army, forced them to sign a peace deal the Dayton Accord the siege and why the war ended, you know. So, I mean, what does, what does this tell us? Does that tell us that, you know, for all the good words, and they are good words, and, you know, good idea, I would argue, about human rights, that, um, you know, at the end of the day, you need force to, to get these people to talk. You now, if we're talking about making the case for getting involved in, in, in Syria, learning from these lessons of history, um, should we not, you know, we should be bombing Assad, shouldn't we? What do we think? Mm -hmm. so bombings might not be best because they could kill innocent people when you're not intending to. Yeah. Indeed, it did. Um, actually, when NATO got involved, the killing of civilians increased. Uh, the massacres increased because they'd been going, up, going at a steady rate up until then. But basically, when NATO got involved, the Serbs thought, thought, right, let's kill as many as we can before it ends. Let's kill as many as we can. Um, you know, horrible idea, but that's what happened. Also, NATO, you know, is in inevitable in any war. Civilians were killed. Um, I think one of the worst ones was um, they somehow targeted a civilian train and killed several dozen people if not more than a hundred people on a train with you know, civilians firing at night. Um, terrible stuff, but some people would argue, well, how else can you bring can you bring a, a cruel regime to its needs than other than, than by using force? Um, let me zoom in on some of these pictures, make it a bit clearer. So that's Sarajevo there burning. And that was the parliament building in Bosnia. Uh, under attack. This little um, this little map here kind of shows you what situation we're in. So you've got the Serbs who'd come into Bosnia to take the land that they thought was theirs. So this is Bosnian free territory. And if you notice, look, the Serbs had it almost completely surrounded. And it was like that for nearly four years and the Serb forces were up on the hills sort of firing down into the city, mortaring it. Um, people still living there. Men, men, a lot of people still living there going about. I mean, there's a video that I wanted to show which is not graphic. I mean, it's quite chilling in a sense because these people are trying to go about the daily business while they're being shot at. But um, there's a video of, it doesn't show anyone getting shot. People going about the daily lives or they're going to work, but they're being shot at at the same time and they're all sort of flinching, but they're all sort of. Run, they're all, it looks like it's on speed up because everyone's moved, everyone's running everywhere or, or walking really fast and all the buses and the bus drivers are driving like loonies and then uh, people are ducking, you hear a fire, a sh uh, like a gunshot, people go <laughs> but then there's like one old guy who's just stood there smoking a fag who's not bothered at all uh, it's, it's kind of a comedic looking um, video but it's absolutely terrifying as well because you know trying to live your daily life while you're being shot at and you can hear the gunfire <laughs> um, terrible uh, ok so I mean you get a little feel of this you know people cowering in the streets that's not blood there what that is it's, it's, it's the, one of the mortars if you were to go to Sarajevo today you would see the, the impacts of the mortars and what they've done they've filled them in with this sort of red concrete this okay. sort of a memorial and you would find these across Sarajevo in the marketplaces. Now, again, when I'm doing this, I don't want to... There's a, there's a balance between 
showing stuff that's hard hitting because you want to make an impact and show that you know if I if I show you that, hopefully you get a feel that the kind of terror that people are under. What I don't want to do is be crass or show disturbing pictures because if you type on if you go on the internet and type in you know Sarajevo siege, you'll see horrific images of people shot, the aftermaths of of these bombs. Um, and I don't want to upset people, but at the same time, I don't just want to portray it in such a, a way that even though you know it's bad, some level maybe you think it was not as bad as what it, as what it was. You know, if you were to go and search for Sarajevo, so you see some horrific images. Um, okay, so that's what was happening in Sarajevo. I want to, I mean, that's the video that doesn't work if they get the people who try and do the daily lives. Uh, Srebrenica massacre. Um, again, this was another, and this was this was more on the UN. This one, I mean, this seems like a total, well, not not a total cock up, but it was it was definitely something bad that happened. The Dutch forces were under pressure, and was, I can appreciate that. Okay, so what you've got, Srebrenica is a town, it's sort of in the the east of in the east of Bosnia, under the Serbs had occupied. Well, they'd occupied all the land around. But what, what had established, as we'll zoom in and we'll look at those pictures, the UN had established a safe zone around the town of Srebrenica. And it was, it was, un, the, it was the Dutch army that were, that were looking after it under the UN's command. But what their rules of engagement were was, yes, to try and protect people, but they couldn't actually fight back against the Serbs unless they were directly fired on. So they were trying to like corral people in and get them to safety but they couldn't fire back unless they were directly fired on themselves so the fact that you know civilians were being sort of picked off their rules of engagement were not to fight back um, and there's this guy as we'll see this this we'll come back this Ratko Maladic he was the general in charge of, 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 of the campaign basically the Serb forces campaign to push into Bosnia and take that land uh, and what he did, it was he came to the Dutch commander who was in charge of that UN force, and he basically said, "We'll do a deal. Um, I'll let it, let us have the town. We will let everyone free go. They can go into another zone where we're not in control. We'll let them go. Let us have the town. We'll let everyone go. Don't worry." The Dutch commander agreed to that. Now, do you think that turned out as a happy story? Do you think that Mladic kept his promise. No. no, what they did was they, they separated, I'm, I'm sure the, the women and girls were probably subject to terrible things too, but the, the, the key was is that the 8,000 men and boys were actually separated out and, and massacred by Mladic's forces and buried in mass graves. And it was the worst single killing that has took place in Europe since, since World War II, since the Nazis. Um, and maybe other massacres um, like uh, uh, I think it's Stettin I'm not sure, the, the terrible massacre that the um, Soviets perpetrated against the Polish officers I can't, can't, the name escapes me but those, particularly those totalitarian massacres um, How do we feel about that? Do we feel like the Dutch were just completely naive and clueless, or were they in a bad situation and trying to believe that they could do something, make a compromise to save life? I think probably the second one, they'd probably been through all that and then there was a bit of hope that they could get out of it. Yeah, so for example, again, I didn't want to show bloody, you know, horrible pictures of of people being exhumed from mass graves but here we see um, the graves from one of the massacre sites and again it had those horrible con connotations of um, you know religious hatred because it was about picking on the Muslims so it had that religious element to it similar to the Nazis picking on Jews um, and, and in this little uh, just to show that, that where we are look so this was Bosnia and this was the land that the Serbs had taken and Srebrenica was here. So it was a safe area within this occupied zone. And Mladic said, let us have this. We'll let everyone pass. 
out of here, they can go there. But obviously he didn't keep his promise. Um, you can see here a bit of reflection, but you've got the, the people arriving, and you've got the, the Dutch troops there with the blue UN helmets, you know, pretty overwhelmed. And here we see, look, that's Mladic and the uh, Dutch commander um, sort of toasting, you know, giving a toast that they've solved this, this situation. This obviously before the massacre took place. Um, you can see Mladic there. How, how do you think he, that's Mladic and his crony and there, the Dutch guys. How, how, what do we think about the looks on their faces? Yeah, they appear to be a smirking. Yeah. Not nice. I think these guys look a bit nervous. He's giving him a kind of a sideways glance, isn't he? Yeah. So, um, yeah. They look like they've, they've got away with it, don't they? And then afterwards, obviously, they, they broke their promise and killed all those uh, men and boys. Um, so, pretty bad stuff. But what happened to these guys then? The likes of Mladic and uh, Slobodan Milosevic and someone called Radovan Karadzic. The, the sort of so again, you might not want to write down everything about these, but it is important to know. So the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. We, we touched on this a little bit in previous lessons, but I want to, I want to, I want us to focus on this. And I, I'm not just telling you this because it's important, but I'm telling you this because. Maybe we should like to see Assad and his generals and his sort of cronies up on up in up in court like this getting sentenced. Um, so let me explain a little bit about who these people were. So Milosevic was the president of Serbia. He started the war. Karadic, he was the president of this thing called Republic of Serbska, which was kind of like a, um, it was a made-up country. That wanted to join with Serbia. That wanted to secede. Secede. Not succeed, it's something like that. Secede. S U C. I think it might be E D. Secede. Secede from Bosnia. And join Serbia. So, just to point that out again, sorry, I'll come back to this in a sec. So, um, let's come back to that. So, Karadic was the president of this this thing here. So when Bosnia, when Serbia invaded, he said, "Right, I'm the president of this land. I want that to join in." He was actually one of the forces that was most calling for um, genocide. Um, okay. And Mladic was the general who carried out the wishes, basically. Um, he was the he was the one who on the ground carried out the massacres. Um, the general of the Serb army. So what what was important to note about these guys is that they were, they were eventually caught. I mean, they were on the run for for years, these guys. Uh, Mosovic was actually arrested in about 1992, 1992, no, it must have been after 2000, I think 2001. He was actually arrested by his own police force because they were sick of him starting wars. So the country actually had enough of him, arrested him and handed him over to... Um, over to the, the International Criminal Tribunal because after the whole Serbia thing, then another war kicked off in a little country called Kosovo against the same similar kind of situation. NATO got involved bombing, bombing, bombing. His own people got fed up with him, handed him over. Um, 
he went on trial, charged with 66 counts of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. Now, Morsevich actually died in 2006 while he was on trial. Um, and yeah, you always get these daft conspiracy theories about him being poisoned, but he was quite old and he was he was under a lot of stress. You know, he was facing life imprisonment and he was, you know, just on trial in custody, you know, for years already. Um, but what's important to know about Morsevich is, well, actually, I'll come back to that. Karadich. Sentenced in 2016, 40 years in his capacity as the President of the Republic of Serbia on 11 counts of ordering genocide, like Srebrenica, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Um, I, I said that the war finished in about 95, 96. He was on the run for ages. Um, he, could, could not, he was, can you sort of make him out there? Grew a big beard and was actually living in Serbia for nearly 10 years, I think, before they caught him. I can't quite remember the story of how they caught him. But um, he was posing as a, as like a faith healer, you know, like someone who does crystal healing and all that kind of stuff. That's how he was making his living. Changed his name, obviously, or had a fake name. Um, but he managed to escape to get away with it for quite a long time. Again, Mladic. Mladic was... Um, living in a little cottage or a little house out in the Serb countryside. Uh, again, found after many years. Um, it's interesting with, with what happened with Mladic because what they thought, or well, what has, which sounds plausible to me, is that this, the Serb government kind of knew where he was for a long time, but they wanted to join the European Union, So, which they're not actually a member of at the moment. So part of that is, you know, get rid of all your war criminals. So they eventually said, right, well, let's go and arrest him then, and they did. So Mladic 2017, he's in life in prison. So both of these both of these men are in prison for the rest of their lives. Um, siege of Sarajevo, carrying out the siege of Sarajevo or Srebrenica massacre, 11 counts of genocide, crimes against humanity, violations of law and war. Right, now the important point to make is that some people would argue that these kind of courts are what's called victor's justice, where it's just like a kangaroo court and... Um, you know, it's already, the, the, the outcome is already established. I've been like, reading this book recently. History of Political Trials, and that basic, that argument that, you know, have you heard of the term victor's justice, or the term kangaroo court? I mentioned it before. Yeah, I heard the second one before. So what's a kangaroo court? Um, I'm not sure. It's just where you get someone, and the verdict's already been decided, and it's just a farce. You just get someone, say, you're guilty, and then throw them in jail or kill them. No real trial. Some people have argued that these that these trials are like that. But but what's important to note is, for a start, these people when they're on trial, they have access to a defence team. They had defence team, and they were also able they were actually able to argue their point and get 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 their sentences reduced or get get um what's the, what's the word when you accusations no it's not accusations when when charges that's it charges dropped. So, for example, within that 11 counts, there were, there were two counts of genocide. So, a count of genocide in terms of Sarajevo and, uh, sorry, in, in Sarajevo and Srebrenica, but then there were the other charge was that he'd ordered other massacres that took place. They couldn't actually prove that. So, instead of being convicted on two counts of genocide, he was only convicted on one. So, it's not just a kangaroo court. They were able to, you know, reduce this even though it makes no difference. They weren't able to just accuse him of things and, and charge him with everything. They did have a defence and they were actually able to um, not not convict him on, on everything that he was charged with. Same with um, Mosevic. Interesting. What If it had lived, what could have been the outcome? I mean, he was the president. He was the one who had started it. He charged with 66 counts of these kind of crimes. Now, when Karadic was sentenced, in the ruling there is this, this phrase that there was insufficient evidence to link him to the ethnic cleansing. Now, I'm sure he would have been convicted of other things. But basically, what it seemed to hint at was that it was him who really who was really um, wanting to kill you know, the other ethnic groups, the other religions that were in, that, that were in Bosnia, or in Republic of Serbia, as they called it. And obviously, Mladic has carried that out. But the argument being that um, what... what 
Lord Sivic wanted. He wanted the land, but he didn't necessarily want to kill everyone. He wanted to take the land for Serbia. <coughs> but he didn't necessarily want to kill anyone. He was kind of at loggerheads with these two. So therefore, um, maybe he wouldn't have been found guilty of everything that is on there, but I'm sure he probably would have been found guilty of many other things, because he bloody started the war. And it's, you know, I'm sure there must have been... There must have been... I'm sure there were things probably that he said, or... I don't know, I'm not an expert on that, but... That hinted at that this is going to happen, or at least, you know, if you start a war, the bad people are going to come out of the woodwork and start doing all this stuff, whether you agree with it or not. Um, so I'm sure he would have been sentence, but it's whether it's whether he would have got all 66 counts you know, found guilty of. So it's not a kangaroo court, I would argue. Because they, they have managed to defend themselves and get things knocked off. What do you think? Or should I say, do you think that therefore we should be invading, invading Syria and getting Assad? And these guys putting them on, tra on trial like these ones. Mm -hmm. I think we should. I think at least might sort of bring it to a close rather than letting it continue. You think it would actually be militarily easy for British, American, other forces to actually go into Syria like they did and occupy Syria? Mm, no. <coughs> Why not? Or if that's um, if that's too pointed a question to ask, I mean, Syria, Serbia was a lot weaker militarily than Syria is, and there's not, there was there wasn't the same kind of fighting level of fighting going on. Um, okay, so then, how should we intervene in Syria? Um, I might just have to take a little break, just for a second. I just really feel like. Um, can you just have a look at that and read through, if you can read through that and have a look at that and that. Uh, just have a look through, I'll be back in a minute. Um,
sorry about that. Let me just turn it back. Any thoughts? Have you had a look at that, Harry? Any thoughts? Any? Yeah, there's quite a lot of detail on it. Yeah. It sort of lists all the people that were convicted from. Yeah. Things. Um, I suppose the main point is, I mean, how much did each each trial cost? Quite a lot. Yeah. But if we just look at Yugoslavia, seeing as we're on that at the moment. Say how much it's over two billion dollars. How many people were convicted? I mean, that's a few years old, but 66. 66, yeah. So that's a lot of money, and money should be no object. But to bring 66 people to court, because the huge trials, absolutely gigantic, they've gone for years, massive amounts of evidence. Um, I mean, what do you think about that? I don't want to say you think it's worth it in that crude economic sense, but is this something that we should be evolving towards more and more? Should, should we, would we like to see Assad on trial for this? I mean, who knows how many, how much that would cost? You know, this Syrian conflict's been going on for the best part of a decade now. How many people would be indicted? How much, how much evidence gathering there would be? Quite a lot. Um Probably more than yeah. this one. I'm sure there would be absolutely loads. So this brings us back, uh, as I was, I was always saying. So why have I told you all about all about all these things? And if we looked at Rwanda, we've looked at what happened in the former Yugoslavia. Um, why am I telling you this? If we're now we're going to have a little look at Syria, just to show how effective the UN have been or not been in mm. certain other issues. Yeah. So how they would be likely to be if they were to intervene in Syria? Yeah, and I know I've supposedly load, I've loaded the question because I'm trying to, in future lessons, I'll put the case against what Kremlin made the case for. Um, so, I mean, what's your thoughts? Do you think we should be, just in general, do you think we should be intervening in Syria? Yeah. Why is that? Because um, so, if we let it continue, it's just going to get worse and more people are just going to die. So we need to sort of at least slow it down if we're unable to stop it. Yep. Okay, yeah, so I mean that's that's the argument that some people make. That one down. So you know this legacy of Rwanda and Yugoslavia, does that not mean that we, we if we sit back, don't do anything? You know, we're we gonna end up with another Rwanda. I mean it's nearly as bad as that already. It could get far worse. Um, you know, should should the aim be to arrest Assad, you know, put him on trial, same as Mosevich and the, the others. Um, I mean, it's, it's claimed that Assad has used chemical weapons 50 times. Uh, there was a Security Council resolution passed against him in June, that should say 2014, by the way. A little mistake there. I mean, the last time there was... I mean, it's been used loads, but the last time there was a major, it was a major use, back in 2014, and the Security Council, they did actually manage to agree. I mean, Russia uh, watered it down a lot, but um, they, they, they basically said Syria must destroy its weapons of mass destruction, its chemical knowledge of weapons by... Um, 30th of June 2014, or else. Um, and they did actually destroy a lot, and it was verified. The UN inspections team went and verified a lot of this. Um, but it's still, still, uh, still carrying on. Obviously, latest gassing of Yuma on 7th of April 2018 just recently led to uh, US-UK airstrikes. Um, Is this not the language that, we, that these kind of dictatorships only understand? Theresa May, people might argue, has done the right thing. What do you think? That's probably right, but yeah, if there's sort of innocent people that are caught up in it, mm -hmm. then it's not 
right? They should have found a, a different way of doing it where they wouldn't have affected innocent people. Yeah. Zoom in on some pictures. So as I was saying in future lessons, the lessons that you ask you to, to look at a conflict in detail, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at the Syria conflict. What happened? The background to it. And basically, in that one, I'll be making the case against getting involved in Syria. This, this is making the case for getting involved in Syria. So, for example, again, not to be, you can't see it very well in this, not to be super graphic, um, but this is, you can't see it, but maybe that's a good thing, not that you can see very much. But um, it's basically people covered over in cloths because they've been gassed in the recent, recent attack. And there we see front cover of the Daily Mail from somebody just gone out, I remember. Um, you know, Trump, mission accomplished, May launching missiles should, should we is that not right that we do that in response to things like that um, look, some people might see it as just being as bad as them mm -hmm. but sort of acting in a similar way yeah so some people might say that um, what you have is you have a symbolic response so it, something bad happens and what you have is just, it's just symbolic. Okay, we're outraged, we've got to do something, let's fire off some missiles. We've really made a difference there. Um, some people see this as just kind of a reflexive, a reflexive kind of um, virtue signal, if you've ever heard of that phrase. You know, we're right, we're morally right, we're going to punish this guy. Let's fire off some missiles. But in fact, you know, some people would say, that this is, you know, killing civilians. Other people would say, no, we absolutely have to take practical steps to degrade, um, to degrade Assad's capability to fight, and we can do that by destroying the factories where they're making this stuff. And yeah, it's not going to bring him to peace, but it'll maybe stop him being able to do this stuff, and we need to do it. Okay. And just to finish off then, I suppose the point that I'm making, um, I've got quite a, to, to wrap this up. So this is Trump. Russia shoot down, to shoot down any and all missiles fired at Syria. Get ready, Russia, because they will be coming nice and new and smart. You shouldn't be partners with a gas-killing animal who kills his own people and enjoys it. So this would be the argument, you know, that force must be met by force. Uh, if you've got Assad, you know, psychopath, and some people would argue, well, maybe you should have another person who's... Can we use that word? You know, some, some people might say he's a bit 
on the edge there, you know, and that will balance each other out, stop him? Or is it just a case of quite explicit, well, this is a very famous phrase, this is actually a picture from, from the Vietnam War, you know, that, that that kind of attitude is absolutely ridiculous. You know, as you've said, how how can bombing save life? You know, you're going to kill, kill innocent people. What, what do we think about this? Do we need strong international action to punish transgressors, or is it a case of something like this sentiment? Probably more like that one. See, it shouldn't be bombing them. They should be thinking of better ways to sort of like bring them to justice, but not through violence that would could hurt innocent people. Sort of like before when they had the like putting them on trial for mm. Rwanda and Yugoslavia. Mm. It should be like that, mm. but done as peacefully as possible without killing innocent people. Um, well, and that's the argument that we're going to look at in future lessons. There, there is actually a peace process, so to speak, underway to try and resolve the situation in, in Syria through peaceful means. But whether you do that through leveraging force, that's uh, you know you, the, you can do that from a position whereby we've beaten Assad down to the point where he, um, he, he has to give in, basically, is, is another issue. Or can you do it purely peacefully? You know, what, what would happen if the other countries didn't get involved? Well, that's a rather big question to ask. Um, okay, so any questions then, at sort of at, towards the end of this? I want to send a, set a homework question, but any questions or clarifications you think we need at um, the end of this particular lesson? No. No, you're, you're okay with it? You understand that? Yeah. Oh. Okay, so 